my dad's body is in there. Right, okay. okay. Yep, okay. Um, obviously, I'll What about your arm? Um, a little bit more complicated. Virginia McCullough was described by neighbours as a fairly eccentric person. You know, like the, like the local oddball. For example, neighbours would be walking the dog outside her home, the family home where she lived in, and they would hear screaming coming from all hours of the night and frankly of the day too. Strange noises actually had been coming for quite a long time from this fairly unremarkable house in this small, quiet town. One neighbour, for example, said that last year, referring to 2023, he had seen Virginia McCullough wandering around wearing a maternity dress. Allegedly, multiple people would say she came in with a fake, a fake pregnancy bump, basically telling everybody she had a bun in the oven while everybody actually knew that she was a bullshit artist. She was in her early 30s, she was single, and she was still living at home with her parents. Though, you know what? Her parents hadn't actually been seen in quite a long time. Now that you mention it, most people thought that her parents had gone to like the nearby seaside town, which they often did, leaving Virginia, their youngest child, at home alone by herself. And she was basically kind of sort of going insane. The truth is she was already insane and the parents had been inside the home the entire time. No one in here at the moment. Uh, can we go in there for a second, just so I can tell you something? Oh, what's in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then, yeah, I want to tell us something. Anyways, and I said, I need to tell you something about what's upstairs on the top floor as well. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, you and welcome. My name is Mike, and yeah, I know this thing is new. I'll get to it at the very end. But before we get into it, please subscribe to see new stories for the dark every single week. Now. Let's give it a go. Cheer up, at least you caught the bad guy. There had been some strange goings on in the town of Chelmsford, which is in Essex, UK. It's just north, northeast of London. In a smallish house there, three stories high on the southeast side of town, well, things were allowed to quiet very dramatically. In that home lived the McCullough family, made up of John and Lois McCullough and their five daughters. By the time 2019 rolled around, though, of course, it was just John and Lois living there with their youngest of five daughters, Virginia. The other four had, like, flown, flown the roost and gone to do whatever they wanted to do with their lives. In 2019, John McCullough was 70 years of age, a retired business studies lecturer. Previously, he had taught at the Anglia Ruskin University, and his wife Lois was 71 years of age. And well, things had been going wrong for, for quite a while now at this stage. Basically, all of their money had been vanishing into thin air. So the parents were retired after busting their ass their entire life, yet their youngest child, who was 31 in 2019, was still living at home. And you know what? There ain't nothing wrong with that in this economy. To John and Lois, Virginia was a well-qualified young woman who was working hard to secure her dream of becoming an artist. After all, Virginia took care of them. She had never been in trouble with the law before. Nothing of that sort. I mean, sure, she could be, you know, a bit weird at times, but all great artists are nut jobs. See, her parents had some medical issues. Her dad, John, he had hypertension, he had diabetes, type 2, hypercholesterolemia, which I'm sure I butchered that wrong, and glaucoma. Lois, the mom too, she wasn't the best, but she had more kind of mental health issues. She had severe anxiety, she had agoraphobia and she had traits of obsessive compulsive disorder. So that kind of meant that Virginia had to do a lot around the home. And of course, her parents relied on their youngest daughter, Virginia, a lot. To them, she was an angel. So they were only, you know, more than happy to have Virginia still living with them in this small town of Chelmsford. And both parents, they had their hobbies. John, he loved golf and snooker, and he was a real joke teller, mad for it, so he was. Lois was described as kind, caring, and thoughtful whose grandchildren were the light of her life. John, for example, would often give Virginia money and she had full access to his finances. See, John relied on Virginia, daughter, caregiver to deal with all of the financial obligations. In return for all this, Virginia lived rent-free in the family home. She was working. She told her parents she was a salaried web designer. She went into the office every day. Did she though? She probably just went for a walk around town. Who knows these things? And all the while, get this, folks, she was studying to be an artist. Eventually, she would, you know, make it. She would be rich and she could take care of her parents with this ultra luxurious life. That was the plan, right? Stick to the plan. Did she? No. Now, Virginia's sisters had a very different view of her than her parents did. 
As is the case in a lot of families, you know, the youngest, the, ba the baby is seen as like the angel, you know, can do no wrong in the parents' eyes. And of course, they relied on her for so much, you know, she was great. But her sisters, of which she had four sisters, they would say that she was uh, weird, uh, socially awkward, and, well, a compulsive liar. And so when John and Lois would check their bank accounts from, from time to time, they began to notice something was a bit odd. Something was a bit off, you know, a bit, a bit, we, a weirdo, some weird was happening here. The numbers uh, when they checked her bank accounts were smaller than they should have been. Like a lot smaller. So from time to time, they would bring this up with their daughter, Virginia, who, as I said, you know, she had, she had full access to their accounts and they'd be like, hey, you know, you know anything about this money? Where's it all going? Our nest egg is, well, I mean, you know, once it was like a big old egg and now it's Cabaret cream. So where's it all going? They would look through their bank statements and see thousands upon thousands of pounds were being withdrawn and sent to various places. You wouldn't believe it. And it was still, it was like pretty constant. It was almost like every day there was like a little bit more being taken out, a little bit more being taken out. And so when Virginia was asked as the only other person who would have had access to the accounts, she was like, hmm, folks, listen up. The banks, they're screwing us yet again. They're, I know what they're doing. They're always at it. Banks are always at this kind of stuff. That would be one reason for all of these mysterious transactions, bank failures. Another reason she would say would be hackers. Those dang dirty troll hackers have got us yet again. And John and Lois would be like, well, all right. John and Lois, they both slept in separate beds and you know, they had their issues, mental, physical, and financial issues too. So when both John and Lois stopped being seen around the town of Chelmsford around mid-June, 2019. At first, people didn't think it was like insanely odd or anything like that. On June 18th, 2019, one of Virginia's sisters got a text that read, your dad and I are at the seaside in Walton this week. Mum, X. Then later that night, another text that read, good night, mum, X. And sort of from then on, things in this small house in Chelmsford became more and more secretive as the days turned to weeks, turned to months, turned to years. If you can believe that, folks, I know. Buckle up. Relatives would ask, you know, about John and Lois, you know, call them, text them, and every time they were asking, you know, hey, do you want to pop over? Or how about we pop over to you? Not gonna happen today, folks. Sorry, they were unwell. They were at the seaside uh, in this place called Clacton on Sea. They were hanging out there. They just weren't feeling so good. Oh, sorry, we're out and about. Odd that no one would ever bump into them or anything. Like John, one of his very close friends, they would meet up for pints every Friday night and then John just suddenly stopped appearing but you know they were a bit reclusive and Lois she was agoraphobic so that would explain why she wasn't really seen terribly often either. That's not to say though that no one ever heard from them. Uh, one of her daughters received a call from Lois and she certainly sounded sick on that call. Her voice was kind of creaky, kind of muffled, and she certainly sounded, you know, under the weather, not like her usual Lois self. And John and Lois would make plenty of calls to the local police, and they were often like trivial, tri these trivial ass phone calls, you know, given out to the Essex police about kids or the weather or whatever kind of came into their head. It was actually a very frankly strange thing about this, is how often they would call the police, or well, rather, Lois would call the police, or John with a weirdly feminine voice. Their GP would get calls. As I said, both John and Lois, they had, they were ill, they had myriad health issues. And so these health issues, as you can imagine, would require constant treatment. Therefore, they would have, you know, regularly scheduled appointments with their local general practitioner. But they were like, ah, can't make it this time. I'm feeling a lot better. All sorts of things to just not go and see their local doctor. It was actually, frankly, lads, quite weird. We're feeling sunshiny fresh. And then, get a load of this, something happened that would give everybody an extremely good reason not to visit John and Lois. And this was a good reason basically everybody around the world had, because nine months after they were last seen in June 2019, something happened in March 2020 that meant no one could see anybody. It was a very different Britain that woke up this morning. Normally busy roads were hushed, as most people acted on the government's new measures. Around Britain, keeping people at arm's length is the new normal. Yep, COVID restrictions hit like a ton of bricks and basically meant nobody could, could see John and Lois even if they wanted to. And to cap it all off over the following weeks and, and then months, Virginia McCullough, the only member of the McCullough family anybody was seeing in Chelmsford. She was acting stranger, stranger, and then a little bit more some. Now, I'm sure you probably experienced, I mean, I think we kind of all have. Everybody went like a little bit loony. Little Looney Tunes. 
Uh, during the COVID restrictions and the pandemic, mental health issues skyrocketed around the world from isolation, from being kept at home, from, well, everything, all of that shite. People still act differently. I mean, I think a lot of people feel that way. So when Virginia started acting a little bit differently, people kind of just sort of put it down. They kind of just sort of, sort of put it down to that. She's got pandemic dementia. But when she was screaming in her home at presumably her parents, that was a bit like, yikes. Why was she screaming at her lovely, kindly old parents? That's when Virginia started going around town with a clearly fake uh, pregnancy belly. That was a bit odd. Like everybody was like, you're clearly fake. Fake pregnancy scans of, of babies that she clearly just like printed off the internet. Hey, <laughs> check this out. It's a baby. Okay. Nobody believed her. Like it was literally like the local crazy person going around town. She would bring people gifts for some reason, unwanted gifts as if she was trying to like buy friends in a very weird way. And the gifts she would give would be food. And I'm not talking about you like going down to the local store and buying some food you can cook. I'm talking about she would like McDonald's. Like she would go down to the local Chinese takeaway, buy a shitload of food and like leave it on her neighbor's doorstep, even though he clearly did not want it. She would give them bottles of like Southern Comfort, which I have very bad memories of from college. Passersby would see her a lot. Standing in front of, as you can see, like there's a very short front garden, whatever, yard, whatever you want to call it. She would be standing there sweeping all day. The like five or six dead leaves that just happened to be laying there. It really seemed like she didn't want to be inside her own house. And over time, as society drifted into this post-pandy world, there was a growing disquiet about John and, and Lois, who, you know, they were believed to be alive. People, you know, would get texts from them, sometimes even calls, but no one had actually seen them. Not physically. Virginia would be asked, you know, by neighbors, oh, how's, how's John and Lois? I haven't seen them around for a while. She would say they're grat. They're at that seaside place in Walton. And you know what? They've been there for so long that they, they don't want to come back. And in fact, they're kind of annoyed about how many rumors you guys have been spreading about them since you haven't seen them. I've heard what you guys are saying. They're pissed off at you. She's basically using the fact that they hadn't been seen as a reason to extend why they hadn't been seen. Friends of theirs would get postcards from the Clacton on Sea area, you know, saying, oh, happy Christmas or whatever, whatever, some such. Though the handwriting was always just like a little bit off. The calls to the police from the McCullough home were still ongoing <laughs> from John, Lois and Virginia herself. Even locals would say that they believed that there had been about 150 calls made to the Essex police over like this few year period. One time Virginia claimed to have been attacked by tree intruders in her backyard. She said she had awoken in the middle of the night, heard a noise out there and had you know, gone out fisticuffs style to fend them off. And then, you know, she called the police, although locals who had seen the marks said it was weird. It didn't seem like her at all. It seemed like she had like these strangely geometric cuts on her face, almost as if she had like leaned too far into something else. The police came to her house. They interviewed her about this mysterious, you know, this alleged assault in her own home, feet away from her horrifying secret. But this whole weird attack never went anywhere and the police eventually just closed the case. There was a very strange thing with Virginia McCullough. She was calling the police constantly. She was inviting the police into her home. Nobody really knows why, when she had something very dark and disturbing to hide, why she was trying to contact the police so much. It was, part of it seems like maybe she was sort of, I don't know, begging the police to, hey, come investigate me. I'm trying to draw your attention to me. Or she was just like, wanted to become so annoying that the police would never suspect anything about her. Like 150 calls, pretending to be attacked, inviting the police into her own home to be questioned. It doesn't make any sense for a normal, I mean, well, I suppose that's using logic, but then Virginia is someone who certainly didn't use that ever. And so it was four years, four long ass years after Lois and John had been last seen, four years and three months actually, that their local GP finally truly became concerned because for a lot of those four years, they had very good excuse for not seeing John and, and Lois. Pandemic, can't see anybody. But now that it was post pandemic, it's like, where are they? It had been happening again and again that Virginia McCullough would cancel their regularly scheduled GP visits, you know, on their behalf. But they had myriad health issues. They had prescriptions that they needed to be collected. They needed to be examined physically. And so it's like, well, you gotta show up sometime. Their doctor contacted the Essex County Council's uh, safeguarding team on their website. Basically, if you're concerned about a, a person, child, adult, concerned that there maybe is abuse going on, you can contact them and 
you know, they can look into it or they can contact the police, which is exactly what the Essex County Council's safeguarding team did. They contacted the Essex, uh, Essex police to basically do a welfare check. It was then September 2023, the Essex police rang. Gave uh, old Virginia McCullough a bit of an old ring ring asking about her parents and Virginia. What a story she had for the police when they called. She had this big old long spiel about, oh, you know, they're traveling. She's more creative than Spielberg at this point. You know, telling them this really long, like intricate, detailed story about where her parents had been, why they hadn't been seen. But she was like, you know what, John, the L, the L fellas, they'll be back next month, October 23. They'll be back then. You can check on them and see them personally. The police did not believe any of this story. It was then on September 15th, 2023, at about 12, 10 p.m., that the police, fearing the worst, they gained entry to the home. When they knock knocked on at first on the, on the at the house, no one answered. And so they went around the back of the house and they used this kind of like battering ram thing to, to basically bust through the glass door and get in that way. No one in here at the moment. Hold on. The police. Got it. First thing you see in the corner is what looks like a bed with paintings on top. That's not a bed though. Virginia was never described as a good artist, by the way. And hey, soon they encountered Virginia cool as a cucumber. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. Hey. Show me Stay where you are. Show me your hands. Yeah. Do you need? Yep. Do you need? Yeah. Oh. The time is 12 you're under arrest suspicion of murder against Jonathan Culloch and Lars McCulloch. Yeah. Okay? Do you not say anything, but in my home defence, you do not mention or in question, so I just want anything to do so I can get this. Okay? Right, your rest is necessary right, for a prompt and fitness. Is there anything in the pop that we should know about? Yes, there is. Can I take you to it? No, you can tell me. And John and Lois, where are they? Right here have been for the past four years while Virginia was living with them the entire time. Uh, can we go in there for a second, just so I can tell you something about what's in there? Yeah. 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 I tell us something. The only reason I said I need to tell you something about what's upstairs on the top floor as well. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. okay. Is it in the area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Show right, you. can you explain you it to us, please? Because we're yeah. trying to preserve this. It's now going to be seen. So we need to preserve this the best we can. So I don't want you to have you walking up there, oh all right? Because it's, it's, that, that's for your well being as well as ours. Oh, no, up, up, up. Okay. Up. So what, Thank where, you. where, where will we find your mum? Well, where will we find um, your mum? Okay, so upstairs there are about five wardrobes. Yep. Um, it's behind the bed, but back next to the sink. That's the second one. See, Virginia had been thinking about killing her parents for a long ass time, since March of 2019, if you can believe that. As you have probably guessed, Virginia McCullough had been stealing money from her parents the entire time. There was never any kind of wackery hackers or bullshit going on with her, with her bank statements. Ever since John gave her access to their finances, she was like, don't mind if I do. Virginia McCullough never had a job. She was never a well-qualified web designer. Her last job was in 2017 when she was a bartender. She stole from her parents all the time. She would get loans all the time from various banks, loans in their name, and then yoink, my money. Then of course, when her parents would ask her, where's all our money going? Pff, hackers again, if you can believe that. And they, they just believed her the entire time because she was their youngest, she was their baby. She would never hurt them. She was their caregiver. Things kept getting worse and worse until, well, to the stage where Virginia could, could only see one way out, and that was seeing them out of life. Virginia McCullough would later say that she killed them because she felt trapped, having to be their caregiver the entire time, and she wanted to be free of them, when in reality it truly seemed like it was only a matter of time before her little ploys were discovered and she would be up shit creek. I mean soon she would be anyways, because come June 2019 she was 60 grand in debt. That's a lot of money, and Virginia did not have a job and lived with her parents. Virginia would later describe her mother as a, quote, happiness hoover, hoover is a vacuum cleaner, uh, who would smack her while bathing her as a child. So it seemed like she had, a, you know, a lot of resentment 
in her life for her parents, but, um, I mean, this would all later come out when she's basically trying to control the kitchen sink. And, uh, and as, as to why she, you know, what was her defense against doing something so horrific to both her parents and then keeping this lie going for four years while they decayed inside her own house, where she was at all times. By the end of this, when her secret was finally uncovered, by the way, she had stolen about 150,000 pounds from her parents. Thing was, when the police finally like gained entry to the home, as you can see, it's fairly bare bones, the, the entire house, and it's not exactly the most glamorous house out there. And the police are gaining entry, they never found luxury items. She never went on these uh, you know, extravagant vacations or anything like that. So she had been stealing from her parents and then had ultimately stolen to the tune of £150,000 from her parents. What was she doing with all that money? Online shopping. Online gambling. I guess buying her neighbor a load of Chinese takeaway and Southern Comfort. Because that was kind of it. Like, she didn't even have a good reason for stealing this amount of money. And, um, well, you know, the whole murder thing. Maybe it was that she was stealing all this money from her parents and going to these online gambling slot machines or whatever it was. And she was hoping that one day the money she stole, she would strike rich and be able to repay her parents. But when she got to the stage of being 60 grand in debt around the time she murdered them, well, I guess she, she realized she was never going to strike rich. They were going to find out. You know, the house always wins at the end of the day. So then it was knives out time. Literally. And so she'd been planning this for about three months. And it was then on the evening of June 17th. 2023 that Virginia, using a number of these prescription drugs that she'd been hoarding for like quite a long time, she made a cocktail. She put these drugs into her parents' drink and she said goodnight. Um, I've slipped Spilophos into his drink. Um, there were about two or three drinks that I brought downstairs. Um, and yeah, they were basically he he didn't drink all of them. He only drank probably about half of two. But, um, yeah, when I went in in the morning, this was before my mother, uh, when I went in the morning, early hours, I got up about half an hour early, about um, six o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning. But I came in and he was gone. He was well, gone. Okay. It's, um... The following morning then, Virginia went downstairs. The home was The home was quiet. And in the back room on the ground floor, uh, at the very back, which was John McCullough's bedroom, she went in there and she found him in his bed and he was dead. The cocktail she'd given him the previous night had killed him, the prescription co cocktail. She then went back upstairs to her mother Lois's bedroom, which was directly above John's bedroom. She went in there, she opened the door and her mother was on the bed with her back to the wall. But she was listening to the radio. She was awake. She was conscious. She said hello to for Virginia, she walked in. Now, Virginia had a good idea that this was going to happen because she had given her mother less of the drugs the night before than she'd given to her father. And her mother also hadn't finished glug-glugged the entire drink. So Virginia thought that her mother might not die, be, be murdered from this cocktail she'd given him. But Virginia had a plan B. She had a backup plan. She went downstairs. She went into the kitchen. She grabbed a hammer. She walked back up into her into her mother's room while she was listening to the radio and began swinging it at her own mother's head. Lois McCullough was conscious of this the entire time. She was found to have defensive wounds on her as she fought for her life against her daughter who was brutally swinging a hammer at her head. Eventually though, Virginia, Virginia dropped the hammer. She went downstairs, she got a knife. She, she didn't think the hammer would finish, finish the job. So then she went back up and she stabbed her mother to death. So, um, murder weapon is upstairs in the living room and um, uh, kitchen room. That's where uh, the knife is. So, um, next bit is very hard to talk about. That's probably the most grisly detail. Um, so, on the um, ground floor, underneath the stairs, um, there's a few like storage boxes and things. Um, and um, in the middle, um, I think it's in one of the boxes or in a bag or something, um, there, um, um, yeah. if you want me to shush after this, it's fine, um, but every bit helps. You'll, you will find forensic bits helpful, there's a hammer, uh, I know, I know, 
I know, but I'm, I'm trying to help so you find everything. It's in the middle underneath the stairs. It will still have blood on it. It's rusted, but it will still have blood traces on it. After this, Virginia went to town. Funnily enough, she actually had to go to the GP, the local GP, who, if it was the same one who would later, you know, report this, or report her parents being missing to the police, that would be a funny coincidence because Virginia had to go to the police because while she was stabbing her mother to death, she accidentally sliced her own hand open. So she had to go have that looked at. And when she was asked, how would you manage that? Cutting vegetables, cutting carrots, you know yourself. Yeah, you can only imagine that would have been in the GP's mind if he was the same one. When four years later, he realizes that around this time, he has not seen her parents in four years. After that, she went into town. She bought plastic gloves and she bought two sleeping bags which she then went home and placed her parents inside each sleeping bag. Then she texted her own sister from her mother's phone pretending to be her, saying, oh yeah, we got off to the seaside. You want to see us around for a bit? She placed her mother inside plastic packing material and then stuffed her into a double wardrobe in her bedroom. The doors were then taped shut and concrete blocks were put in front. John, she turned his bed into a tomb, piling up masonry blocks and wooden panels together, fixing them together with white filler, and then multiple blankets on top. Police would say 11 layers of material covered the body, which was inside a sleeping bag. The pandemic restrictions must have seemed like a gift from God for Virginia McCullough. She'd been covering up her parents' death, disappearance, for like nine months by the time the pandemic restrictions, you know, kicked in, then March 2020 rolls around. Oh, she's got a great... The world has a great reason for not seeing anybody not contacting anybody. No one can come around. People stopped asking if they could. But it all eventually came crashing down. And it appears like, well, way longer than it should have been. Like, how did nobody not see them for four years? How was it the doctor was the first person who, who was a, to notice? Like, none of the other relatives were like, hey, you haven't seen him in like four years. Bit, bit odd, the whole thing. I did know that this would kind of come eventually. Um, it's proper that I serve my punishment. So, yeah. Um, okay, please. so Virginia, I'm just going to ask you this. This is what I've written down based on the information you just told us because what we regard as a significant comment because yeah, you've made well, it upon, under caution after your arrest. By the way, you're part of, that's, they're my granddad's. Okay, right. So I've written this, please. Um, I, Virginia McCulloch, have, inf have informed Police Constables 77329 Brown and 79387 Bowers after entering my house on Friday the 15th of September 2023 that I murdered my father, John McCulloch, who was st stated was under a bed in the rear ground floor of the house and my mother upstairs in a cupboard next to the sink. Wardrobe. Wardrobe. It's a double wardrobe. Right, okay. I've written double cupboard. Wardrobe. It's like four wardrobe doors, but it's the one nearest the sink. Double wardrobe. The cup then. Yeah. What's significant as I've written down there here now, or I've just read out to you. Are you happy mm -hmm. to sign that to say yeah. that's a true, yeah. a true account? Yeah. Yeah, well, at least you caught the bad guy. I've just I know, woken I don't up today and done my job. Like no. I know I don't seem not a lot of percent evil, but we all... <clears throat> Yeah, not I I'm not going to comment on anything. Time. It's not my job to comment on it, no. okay? Because I've got to be impartial with everything, no. okay? So I'm not going to give any comments. No. No, well, I mean, I deserve to obviously uh, get whatever's coming sentence-wise because that's the right thing um, to do. And that might give me a bit of peace. And by how Virginia reacts, it seems like she almost wanted to be caught. It was a relief that she didn't have to be in the house with her parents anymore and she could be taken away. However, she was ultimately a manipulative killer who brutally murdered her two parents, robbed them from the rest of the family, killing in cold blood. She had planned this four months, lied about literally every aspect of her life to everybody around her after doing the unthinkable. In one brief aside, by the way, I actually just want to mention, because when I was like researching and writing this, there was another case which kept coming into my mind, which I hadn't talked about before, and it's startlingly similar. Guess what, folks? Happened in the UK. Happened in a a Essex. Didn't happen in Chelmsford, but happened in another city, which is like less than an hour away. So you can, you can give me that one. This was another case where the victims were an older couple who had been manipulated, manipulated and, then, and then murdered. And in this instance, the killer though wasn't related to them, but he was just as sick and evil 
as Virginia McCullough was. See, sometime between 2012 and 2013, Stephen and Carol Baxter, they met a man through work. A man, his name was Luke DeWitt. See, the Baxters, they owned a very successful shower mat company called Kazplash, which is a, a wonderful name. Uh, and they had hired Luke DeWitt to build them a website. I guess they just need to take things to the next level. I should get me one of those. Over time, the Baxters and their own children, they, they became incredibly close with this Luke DeWitt. Over time, essentially, he became part of their family. One of the reasons was that Luke's father had passed away and Stephen and Carol were just such lovely people that they saw Luke. They thought he was a lonely guy. They thought he was lost after his dad died. They decided to take him under their wing. So he would spend so much time with the Baxters. He would be calling around to the house constantly. He would be going, going for walks. He would become like their confidant. Essentially, as I said, another member of the family. However, Luke was not uh, as lonely or as kind or as innocent as Carol and Stephen Baxter believed him to be. He was a wolf in sheep's, in sheep's clothing, folks. Uh, a man who had slipped into this kind family and then whipped out a switchblade. He would, over time, over I'm talking like a couple of years, create multiple false identities and he would contact the Baxters. Many of these people, these fake people that Luke invented, were sufferers of what's called Hashimoto's disease which is when you have an underactive thyroid gland. And um, it's it, it's treatable, like with medication, and with doctors and such, but if it's left untreated, it can be very life-threatening as it affects your heart and it can damage your heart over time. Carol Baxter had Hashimoto's disease. And so then, you know, over time, she'd be contacted by all these other people who also had Hashimoto's disease. She thought this was a great little like mini support group for her. Now, Carol was getting treated. Her condition was doing just fine. You know, she was getting treated by her doctor for this, for this disease that she had. But guess what? All these people she would be meeting, who'd be like mess messaging her, emailing her. Uh, one was like a doctor from Florida. A, uh, again, a doctor from Florida who didn't exist. Who They would say, Carol, no. Stop listening to your doctor. He's working for a big pharma. Don't believe a word he says. Do you know what will cure it? Not taking your medication and drinking smoothies or... You know, we'll just tell Luke what to give you. He seems like a trustworthy guy. No joke, smoothies and medication that Luke would give to Carol, telling her this will fix you. This will make you good. And using these false identities, he would set up meetings with the Baxters to make these fake people seem real. The Baxters would drive like three, four hours away to a non-existent meeting because of course there'd be nobody there to meet them when they showed up. They'd come home, Luke would be like, ah, don't worry, I'll take care of you. He was also secretly drugging Carol to make her seem more ill than she was giving her all sorts of like strange drugs it, just to make her seem like she was getting worse and worse and worse. Once he even gave Carol a, a pill, like a capsule that had a thumbtack inside, which is just mm, sick. So using all of these false identities that helped insinuate himself more and more with the family until well then finally on April 7th, 2023, he went over to their home with some special medication. He gave them both medication that had been laced with a lethal amount of fentanyl. And he left 61-year-old Stephen Baxter and 64-year-old Carol Baxter to die sitting in their armchairs. Then a couple of days later, Stephen and Carol were found by their daughter, which is uh, horrible. And then, of course, Luke shows up, you know, saying, oh, God, what happened here? Um, and you say you last saw them on Friday. Friday. I, them on, I got home just before eight, so that's when horrible. I left. <laughs> And me and Steve are just talking about work and just the business. Cause Carol can't work anymore. So yeah. Last year she's not been able to do anything. Okay. Um, so we're just having a chat, but he didn't really feel up to it and just no. fair and asked me to go. So that's I fair enough. I was going to come back tomorrow and yeah, and check on them again. The gym and mm -hmm. I'm used to checking on. Always pop in. No, yeah. Because they wanted this weekend. Just, this weekend. Just left them to it. However, after CCTV showed that he was the last person to see them alive, and the medical examiner found fentanyl in their system. The lies and lies and lies came to light. The police would later search uh, Luke DeWitt's home and find 80, 80 electronic devices that he had been using to communicate with the Baxters under these various false identities. It, how does he have that many devices? I don't know. But they also found, more crucially, a picture of both Carol and Stephen dead, sitting in their armchairs. They found that picture on his phone because after he gave them the medication, he came back again later to make sure it had worked, and worked it had. After murdering the couple, Luke had attempted to poorly create a fake will and give himself ownership of the company, Kasplash. 
bit of privacy there, so let's go. Um, Luke, the reason we're here today, mate, is um, I'm going to have to arrest you, mate, all right? Um, and that's on suspicion of murder. All right, as part of a police investigation, you've been identified as being a suspect in relation to the deaths of Caroline and Stephen Baxter, 27th to 9th of April, 2023, all right? Okay. So, I mean, you don't have to say anything, but may harm your defence. If you do not mention any questions, something you may later on in court, anything you do say, may be evidence. Have you been arrested before? No. Never been arrested, don't no? no. Um, the process will be explained throughout, or obviously, with limited information we've got at the moment, but anything further will be explained throughout the investigation, all right? Because um, I've never met you before, and obviously, because of the offence of the allegation, I'm going to put you in handcuffs, but they're going to be at the front <laughs> stack, buddy, all right? Just leave, leave, leave everything yeah, in your yeah. pocket in a minute, mate. Have anything upstairs, like phone, keys, whatever. Luke was arrested while in his office and charged with the two murders. He was later sentenced to a minimum of 37 years in prison. And the police have said they're looking into not only Luke's father's death, which is one of the reasons why he became so like close and tight with the Baxters, they're also looking into his grandfather's death because they believe he could be responsible for more murders than just the Baxters. And much like Luke, whose deception lasted for years, Virginia too, who had done, well, whose deception had lasted for years, she would get a similar sentence to what Luke got. Virginia McCullough would plead guilty before it came to a trial. And so in October of 2024, Virginia was sentenced to a minimum of 36 years in prison. She's 36 years old when she was sentenced, so that likely means that if, if and when she gets out, she will be in her 70s, about the same age as the parents she killed. And that will do it for this old video. Uh, as you may have noticed, there's a big mic in this, not this big mic, this big mic. Uh, the reason why I'm actually recording on this microphone instead of the usual shotgun mic I use on top of the camera is that I'm going to start posting um, the audio of these regular scheduled That Chapter episodes onto the podcast feeds as bonus episodes that will be out on Fridays. So that means for the That Chapter podcast on Monday, you'll get a brand new That Chapter podcast exclusive episode. And then on Fridays, you will get the audio from the main That Chapter videos. So a little, little something extra for you. The reason why I want to use a different microphone is because A, this is the same microphone I use for the podcast. So I want the audio to sound the same. And B, uh, it's actually a much better microphone because I think that's one of the things I get feedback for the most is that like the audio sounds kind of tinny or something in this room. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So I guess it's time I finally started using uh, a new microphone. So hopefully it's not too much like in your way uh, when you're viewing this. Hopefully it's not a distraction for those of you who are, who are watching. Uh, I'll, I'll figure it out over time. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there together. But as always, if you're looking for some more of that chapter, please check out the That Chapter Patreon where you get early access ad-free versions of all videos, plus there's a whole playlist of Patreon-exclusive videos. Check it out, give it a go, or check out the previously mentioned That Chapter podcast, which is brand new episodes every Monday, and then, um, well, bonus episodes on Friday, I guess. Uh, but until the next all one, which will be out when it's out, please take care of each other and please take care of yourselves. Because I love you. Mike out. <laughs>